Yeah, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so before I introduce today's speaker, just a reminder, our last seminar for this semester will be, um, I guess, in two weeks. Yeah, December 12th, two weeks. It'll be here in this room. Uh, and the speaker will be uh, Professor uh, Hamid Garmastani from Material Science and Engineering. And then we'll start again up uh, in January. Um, I can't remember what the first one is, but after we all get back after the, uh, the break. Uh, so it's a real pleasure to have um, my friend and colleague, uh, Professor Hazad Naimi, with us today. Um, Hazad got his uh, bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from Sharif University and then continued to work as a design engineer in Iran before coming uh, to Georgia Tech to get his master's and PhD in electrical and computer engineering. Um, he then worked as a research engineer at the MIRC, for those of you who remember the precursor, precursor of the IEN, um, before becoming a faculty member uh, in ECE in 2008, um, where he's now a full professor, uh, also a associate director for uh, NNCI, the National Nanotechnology Coordinating Infrastructure for uh, Computation and Modeling. Um, he's won a number of awards, including the NSF Career Award, as well as awards from SRC, IEEE, and Georgia Tech for teaching. Um, he last gave a presentation in Nano at Tech in 2009, so there are probably very few of you who remember that. Um, I was there. <laughs> um, but I'm sure this will be very different stuff. So I'll turn it over to Azad. Yeah. Okay, thank you, David, for the nice introduction. And thank you very much for coming to this seminar. Uh, it's my pleasure to share with you some of the work that we've been doing the past uh, couple of years. And um, so uh, without giving too much introduction, we've seen all the charts about Moore's Law and how everything has been scaling down to smaller and smaller dimensions and the level of complexity constantly increasing. One of the things that I sometimes like to look at is, instead of looking at that chart, which was in log scale, looking at the chart in the linear scale, it sometimes uh, gives us a better picture of how rapidly things are evolving. And at the heart of all this exponential growth has been, oh, all right, um, has been the, uh, MOS or metal oxide semiconductor transistor where you modulate the uh, potential barrier in a device in order to control the flow of electrons going from source to drain. Um, yes. So uh, when you apply no voltage to the gate, the energy barrier is this high and therefore you block all the electrons. As you increase the gate voltage, you push the energy barrier down, and then you allow electrons to go from source to drain. But in reality, this doesn't work like a uh, complete and ideal switch because of the, f the way that energy of electrons is distributed. So if you look at the distribution of uh, probability of the states in the source, it follows this Fermi distribution. And um, towards this side, the probability drops exponentially. So this becomes almost like an exponential, which means that as you gradually bring down the, uh, the uh, energy barrier, the number of electrons that have enough energy to go over this barrier increases exponentially, which means that if you look at the current that you get as a result of this modulation of the energy barrier, it increases uh, in, a, in an exponential fashion. So for every 60 millivolt that you shift here, you get one order of magnitude increase in drain current. So this picture, which looks very nice, and you have a really good energy barrier. It's relatively flat inside the channel, no matter how much voltage to the drain you apply. This is valid for a big device, but gradually as people have, have scaled down the dimensions of the device, things have uh, changed because the control that gate has on the channel is through this oxide capacitance, 
But there are other capacitances involved as well. There is some capacitance to ground to do to the substrate and source, and there is a capacitance between the channel and the drain, which means that the, 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 this potential height or this energy profile is not controlled purely by the gate, but also by the drain. So for a small device, uh, for a short channel device, the picture looks something like this. Now if you look, compare this carefully with the case over here, first of all the peak of this energy barrier is now smaller because of the effect of the drain over there. So more electrons can uh, go over the barrier so the leakage increases. Also right at the top here you see that the length of the energy barrier is small so some electrons can tunnel through and go to the other side. So both of these effects increase the leakage. And the other thing is that because these other capacitors are also involved, the change in gate voltage doesn't directly translate here. So that subthreshold swing, that uh, 60 millivolt per decade, is constantly increasing as you make the device smaller. So uh, with this, you know, to summarize these effects, what happens is that this device becomes more and more leaky. So the only solution to this problem is to increase this capacitance and make the control that gate has on the channel better and better. And that has been what industry has been doing for many years. So if you look at the evolution of uh, MOS transistor, it started by an in-plane or planar structure then uh, it, and it was using silicon dioxide as the insulating layer. Then in order to further increase the capacitance without making the oxide too thin, they switched to high K dielectric materials, they changed the uh, gate material to metallic gates, and they kept uh, in improving this device. Then they went to three-dimensional geometry so that instead of trying to reach the the channel only from one side. In a fin-fed structure, which is a 3D structure, you try to reach the gate from three sides. And moving further, people are thinking about nanowires where the channel is surrounded by the gate from all sides. So a gate all around type configuration, either in a horizontal fashion or in a vertical fashion. The, the, the good thing about the vertical, uh, sorry, this one is the vertical, this is the lateral. So the good thing about the vertical dimension is that you can actually make the channel length longer without making the footprint of the device larger. So these are all the changes that are happening and this has been the evolution and probably these will come into production in the next few years. And the industry has a clear uh, roadmap for the next five or ten years and people are now talking so if you look at this geometry this is for something like 14 nanometer this is the dimensions that people are dealing with these are really really tiny dimensions uh, and the push is to go down to five nanometer or three nanometer but at some point you have to change uh, the paradigm you cannot keep scaling things and trying to do the same thing that brings us to the research that I want to talk about today, which is trying to think about completely new ways of doing computation and try to use state variables other than electronic charge or try to reinvent the device and also try to come up with new way of building circuits and systems out of the same devices or out of new devices. So, to motivate that, if you look throughout the history, we've been there multiple times. So um, uh, in the old days, there were computers based on mechanical switches. Then uh, electromechanical switches, you know, relays will be, were used to do computation. Then vacuum tubes, then transistors individually. And then integrated circuits and from bipolar junction transistors to uh, MOSFETs. And we've been working with MOSFETs for many years and there's been this much scaling, but it doesn't mean that this should go forever with MOSFETs. So there may be new devices that can, uh, can, can continue this trend for the years to come. Now, 
when we want to do research on new devices and new circuits, then many things will change at all levels of abstraction. And if you look at the options that are out there and people are studying, there are a vast uh, number of options at each level of abstraction. At the very bottom layer, which is the materials that are being used, people are looking at one-dimensional materials like carbon nanotubes, or looking at 2D materials like graphene, like uh, other 2D materials that have come out uh, in, the re in, in recent years. People are thinking about using ferromagnets to do computation, and I will be talking a lot about ferromagnets or spintronics for doing computation. And recently, people are even interested in anti-ferromagnets because ferromagnets have a delay or a switching time constant around one or two or three nanoseconds. But if you are able to go to anti-ferromagnets, they can switch really, really fast. Um, there's a push to use ferroelectrics, and there's a lot of interest there. There are even people thinking about using strain, uh, taking advantage of piezoelectric devices and apply strain and make switching happen that way. And I will be talking about these devices in the context of uh, spintronics devices. Uh, and oxides making all sorts of uh, um, uh, memristor devices and, and so forth. So the number of options at the material level is quite uh, uh, elaborate and there are many options out there. But then once you look at all these materials, there are so many physical phenomena that you can potentially utilize to do computation. In the past, it was this field effect, MOSFETs, and uh, the effects that are being used there are well known. But now people are too talking about giant magneto resistance effect. Basically, if you have two magnets, and the two magnets are aligned, the resistance is lower than the case that the two magnets are anti-parallel. So that's the giant magneto resistance. If you put a tunnel layer in between the two magnets, then you can even further enhance the change in resistance when the two magnets are parallel versus the, the two magnets being anti-parallel. Uh, an important uh, concept that is being used is magnetostriction. Many of the magnetic materials, when you apply strain to them, their magnetic properties change. So you can have a magnet that is in plane, so the two <coughs> stable conditions are in plane, but as soon as you apply strain, this magnet may go out of plane. So the stable condition may become out of plane. Again, I will be talking about this effect and how one can potentially use this for, uh, uh, for doing computation. Ferroelectric resistance. In ferroelectric devices, uh, if you put two metallic contacts of different kinds and sandwich a ferroelectric layer, uh, depending on the orientation of the ferroelectric layer, you may have high resistance or low resistance. So that's a fundamentally new concept and a new uh, a way of doing computation or new way of storing information because uh, computation has two parts, uh, doing the computation and storing information. So both of them are really important. So I'm not going to go through the rest of the uh, physical phenomena that people are looking at, but the number of options are quite uh, 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 large. Then once you have a physical phenomena and a new material that you can utilize, then there are different ways that you can make a device out of it. You can do the computation using these new physical concepts. And some of them are still field effect devices uh, and evolutionary type of improvement over what we have. And some of them are completely new, like uh, magnetic, magnetic tunnel junction devices for memory applications or uh, ferroelectric tunnel junctions. Uh, negative capacitance devices are the case when you insert a ferroelectric between the gate and the uh, normal insulator. Uh, then you may use some uh, uh, spin wave type computation, which I will be talking briefly about. So there are many options at the device level. And then once you have new devices, 
you have many options how to use these devices to build the circuit and do the computation. Uh, the, the way that we do computation with CMOS is usually through Boolean functions. And you make an adder, a multiplier, and make an ALU, and you do computation that way. But with many of these devices, it may not be the best way of doing things. Uh, you have some new options. You can make majority gates with them. You can make neuromorphic type uh, circuits with them. And as you will see, some of these devices perform much better if you go to these non-traditional uh, types of circuits. And then at the system level, well, traditionally we had CPUs and GPUs, but now people are trying to break the barrier between the computation part and the storage part. So instead of doing computation here, and trying to fetch data and restore data into memory, what if you bring memory and computation into the same place? Or um, new ways of doing computation with approximation or Shannon-inspired computing. And at the end, software and, and operating systems have to look at everything, and uh, that's the higher level of abstraction. Now, uh, you can't really do research on any of these areas, on any of these topics, and not look at what is above and what is below. And a real uh, comprehensive study is needed if you want to come up with something that is completely um, revolutionary and can change the computing paradigm. So in our group, we try to cross the boundaries of these uh, levels of abstraction. And obviously, we cannot do everything. But if, if I look at this chart, this, the size of the boxes here says how much effort we put on each of these areas. So we do a smaller amount on materials, mainly trying to develop compact physical models with capture the key parameters and the key properties of uh, various emerging materials. And it's not just emerging materials, even materials that we are very familiar with, like silicon. If you try to transport spin through silicon, that's a new phenomenon that is not well understood. So you need to develop new models there as well. Um, and for devices, try to develop compact physical models that capture the physics of the devices, and also try to come up with better devices, understand what are the limitations and how they can be overcome and how we can improve them. And then once we have these compact models and circuit level models, we try to analyze some circuits based on these devices, try to find what is the best circuit for each kind of device, and benchmark them and compare with each other, and try to see at the circuit level what are the limits that uh, devices are imposing, and how we can try to mitigate those limitations. And at the system level, we try to come up with methods that in a fast way, you can take parameters from materials and devices and could go to the system level and see what is the performance of the, uh, of the uh, system. What is the throughput? What is the number of instructions per second that you may be able to execute? So you can't do all of this on your own, and the key for us has been collaboration. So we've been collaborating with many people. Uh, on the industry side, uh, being part of SRC, working closely with the sponsors within SRC, we have a close collaboration with Intel over the past five years. We have published a lot together, and we've been working with uh, some of the colleagues at Intel. And we have a close collaboration with IMEC. That's a big institute in Belgium, which most of the semiconductor companies, uh, when, you know, uh, uh, tool vendors, material suppliers, are collaborating there. So working with them has been very uh, instrumental in our research. We, uh, we have started some new collaboration with ARM, especially at, uh, at the system level, and also with Micron and memory devices. But another big effort within our group in the past three years has been this SRC benchmarking research because there are all these centers uh, that are funded by DARPA, SRC, and NIST, which are working on new materials, 
uh, th uh, this frame and new devices, these centers and these centers, and also try to come up with new circuits. So working with these uh, investigators gives us access to real experimental data, uh, many theorists within these centers. So this has been a very productive uh, collaboration. Try to benchmark various materials and devices and compare their performance at the circuit and system level. So this, uh, you know, the benchmarking effort that we took over about uh, three years ago, before that was led by uh, uh, Dmitry Nikonov and Ian Young at Intel. And this is a summary chart which shows you uh, if you execute a 32-bit addition using different, different device concepts, what would be the, uh, the, the energy and what would be the delay associated with that? So there are many device options here, and I'm not going to go through those. Just some highlights. One is this CMOS reference point. And this is based on the ITRS projections for uh, the uh, feature size of 15 nanometer. This, is, this was for the 2018 uh, technology year. This is a relatively optimistic uh, data point because ITRS, the International Technology Roadmap for Semiconductors, used to be quite optimistic. Um, the, the other device is this CMOS low voltage. This is based on theoretical projections for a 0.3 volt gate all around uh, uh, indium arsenide nanowire device, and it's based on atomistic quantum transport simulations. So these two basically show us what's the competition that we have in terms of CMOS can do. And then we are trying to uh, imp look at other devices and see where they stand. And this is not about ranking these devices and see which one is the best, it's because because these are all at the very early stages of research, uh, and it's too soon to say which one is a winner, which one is a loser. But it's, the goal of this approach is to understand the general behavior of these devices and to understand what is limiting their performance, why some of these devices are in the bad corner, and how we can improve them and try to push them to the right corner and try to, to make them competitive. So that's the goal. So this is what was done um, back in 2015. And then since then, uh, we've been working on this. And I'm going to show you more updated results. So after this long introduction, um, the presentation would be on spintronic materials and devices and field effect devices. And then I will we'll be talking about one form of neuromorphic circuits, basically <laughs> cellular neural networks. And you see that some of these devices that were performing very poorly, doing Boolean functions, can potentially do much better if you go to something that takes advantage of the physics of the device. And finally, summarize. So for spintronic uh, devices, just a very uh, uh, brief introduction is that when you pass current through a conductor, the electrons have random spin orientation. And as a result, there is no net spin in the current. So there is no spin polarization. But when you pass electrons through a magnet, uh, depending on the orientation of this magnet, the electrons get polarized around, uh, 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 depending on that magnetic orientation. So the majority of electrons, not all of them, but the majority of the electrons coming out of that magnet will become aligned with the magnet. And then if you pass this spin polarized current on another magnet, you, and uh, if this current is strong enough, then you can actually rotate the orientation of this magnet because these electrons have uh, uh, angular momentum that they can transfer to the magnet and reorient it and make it aligned with the spin polarization of electrons. So here, spin polarization is happening. And here, spin transfer torque is happening. Now, uh, one advantage that these devices have is that this can be all metallic. And therefore, you can have very low voltage operation. And also, magnets can be non-volatile, can 
store information uh, even if you remove power. So these are some of the benefits, but the question is how would you use this to do computation with it and how would be, what would be the performance of it? And I will use this as a case study where you see how going through the levels of hierarchy, starting from materials to devices to circuits, will uh, give us some insight into the operation of these devices. One of the proposed devices was, non, uh, was all spin logic by, uh, by uh, Supriya Data at Purdue. And the idea is that you pass electrons through this magnet and polarize electrons and, and, and inject them into non-magnetic material here like copper. So here spin accumulation is generated because electrons coming from this magnet gets po get polarized according to the orientation of this magnet. So then these spin polarized electrons will diffuse and go, move to the other side and then on this side they will inject a torque on this magnet and will flip this according to this. So this would behave like a buffer. Now, if you connect three of these together, then you can make a majority gate because the spin polarization of electrons that are going to appear here will depend on the majority of the inputs. And then this one can drive the next stage. So this can potentially be a computing paradigm where this would be the building block, the majority gate, communication happens the same way as the computation. And the channel materials that you can use here are uh, any material, uh, any metal like copper or aluminum, or in some cases even graphene. To, to analyze this, you need to look at the dynamic of the magnets. So the LLG equation describes this. And uh, you need to look at the interface between the magnet and the channel, uh, the mixing conductance matrices. You need to look at spin drift diffusion in the channel and then look at the dynamic here. And you can write all these equations in MATLAB and try to solve them self-consistently, which would be time consuming and it would be very messy. And you need to worry about convergence and if these are going to uh, work at the end. But as electrical engineers, we are much more comfortable with circuit and spice and do simulation there. So we took all of these physics and for each one, we came up with a circuit model where, uh, or, or basically a sub-circuit, which exactly replicates the function of each, uh, uh, each block. So here are, this is the dynamic of the magnet simulated by, these, uh, by this sub-circuit. And then uh, these are the interface matrices. And then within the channel, you need to have <coughs> electrical signal because this is a conductor and it has like a, like a normal inner connect you have a distributed RC circuit but at the same time you need to account for X Y and Z components of the spin uh, polarized current so you have these branches which account for the X and Y and Z and then you can just set it up in SPICE and then SPICE will handle this on its own you don't need to worry about the uh, uh, the uh, convergence issues and at the same time it gives us some insight because we are very familiar with these circuits these are distributed RC networks so we know how they behave so as a circuit designer when you see some uh, elements like this you can get much more intuition rather than some MATLAB codes that are solving some equations but at the material level, you also need to be careful because material parameters highly depend on what kind of dimensions you are dealing with, what kind of interfaces you're dealing with, what kind of impurity and doping you're dealing with. So um, part of our work has been to develop uh, compact models for some important parameters like spin diffusion length, spin relaxation length, and we've been calibrating these models with a lot of experiments, so that will give us some important uh, uh, confi some confidence in the uh, results. One thing that I want to mention is that, for example, if you look, you can go and look it up and see that what is the spin diffusion length in copper in bulk material? It's around 500 or 600 nanometer, but you can't use it in a real circuit because at nanoscale, electrons get scattered at the surface, at the grain boundaries. So at nanoscale, you need to worry about the size effects. So this model captures size effects and uh, based on that gives you the uh, spin relaxation length. 
Another way of doing computation is wave computing. And one approach is to use spin waves. So if you have a magnetic layer, you can create spin waves on it. Basically, these magnets will start oscillating, and you can generate wave. And then you can potentially do interference. And based on interference, you can make a majority gauge. If the phase of the inputs are, cons are the same, there's going to be constructive interference. If they are out of phase, you're going to have destructive con uh, interference. And there's been pro uh, proposals to do this way computing based on uh, spin waves. So there were some issues uh, about these the proposals that spin waves are weak and you need to regenerate them every time. You need to have gain. You need to, ha if you just want to use uh, uh, conversion back and forth between electrical signals and, and, and spin waves, then you need to have complicated sense amplifiers. Thermal noise must be accounted for. And these spin waves are non-volatile, whereas magnets are volatile. And one advantage of magnets is non-volatility. How can you use spin waves and build circuits that are still non-volatile? So to do that, our approach has been to use magnetostriction and to use um, uh, piezoelectrics to create spin, to create strain and reorient magnets based on that. So the idea is that we have a magnetoelectric cell. When you apply no voltage, the magnet is in plane. There is no strain, so the magnet is in plane, and it has two stable conditions in positive x or negative x. As soon as you apply voltage to the piezoelectric, you create strain, and then the magnet may go out of plane if the uh, design has been done right. So with this approach, what we can do is we can take the state variable of this magnet being uh, so the orientation of the magnet would be our state variable. So it can be either in positive x or negative x. In order to read the state variable, what we do is we apply a voltage to magnetoelectric. So now the magnet wants to go out of plane. But depending on the initial condition, if it's positive x or negative x, the spin wave that you create is going to have 180 degree phase shift. Now you have generated this spin wave, you have read your state here, and now the receiver needs to detect the phase of this coming spin wave. The way that we do it is the opposite. So on the receiver side, uh, uh, where, where we want to do the right operation, we initially put the magnet in the out of plane case. But when the spin wave arrives, we turn this voltage off. Now the magnet wants to fall in plane. But the direction that it's going to fall will depend on the, sp the, the phase of the spin wave that is coming. So this way, we have generation, regeneration every time. The, uh, the, the circuit is non-volatile. And we can control the direction of flow of information by clocking in the right way. So one of the things that we did was try to see if, if this is reliable under thermal noise. And one thing that you would see is that under, uh, if you put the magnet initially at the high energy, and now the spin wave wants to fall this in either positive x or negative x, you will see that this is not uh, reliable. But the reason is that when you put the magnet in the high energy state, it's going to make many oscillations before it damps and it falls on positive or x directions. But you can use exchange spring system or use the built-in strain to change the energy profile here. And by changing it, you change the profile here such that this, this Z point becomes the saddle point. Now this is going to be a very damped switching. And as soon as it goes into one pole, it's going to converge around that pole. So it's not going to make so many switches between positive x and negative x, which you would do here. And here, it's going to have a deterministic switching. So this is the simulation that we did try to see what would be the error rate. And uh, it seems that we can get to really good error rates for this uh, circuit. So and this is one uh, collaboration that we did with IMEC. And they, they became interested in this proposal. And they wanted to simulate an entire uh, 
entire majority gate and we collaborated with them and did the simulation and this uh, nanoscale uh, majority gate based on spin waves, at least on the simulation side, is working. So this is the summary of the benchmarking results for uh, spintronic devices. So these are, this is the spin wave logic. It's very low energy, but it's slow because still we are dealing with magnets and magnets are uh, that they have time constant in the nanosecond regime. So this is a low energy but relatively slow device. This is a magnetoelectric MTJ device. For the sake of time, I'm going to skip this. The domain wall device. This is using um, spin hall effect, the devices that can be made out of that. And one of the things that you see here is that how we started from this original device and gradually try to make it better. Uh, this is the all spin logic that I showed, and the, this is the in plane version of it. This is the out of plane version of it. And if Hoisler alloys become um, available at room temperature, then this would be the, perform the potential performance of this device. But what you see is that these devices are very energy hungry compared to CMOS, and that's a problem that we need to solve. And we can try to make these materials better to make it better, or we can try to use these materials for something other than Boolean logic that I will be talking about uh, soon. So field effect devices, there are many options. Again, uh, I have to skip the details of these devices, and I just show you the latest benchmarking that uh, we have. These are the so so the CMOS low voltage and CMOS high performance are shown here, but a few highlight devices. This is a thin TFET. This is two layers of 2D materials, and you make a tunneling device out of them. They uh, potential that the tunneling happens between the two layers, and you modulate the, that kind of uh, switching. Uh, this is BISFET, which. Uh, based on boson condensation, and the efforts to demonstrate this has not been successful. This was supposed to be done by a bilayer graphene, so at this point, this is just a theory and uh, it has not been uh, physically demonstrated. Uh, this is a negative differential resistance device based on tunneling between two. Uh, 2D layers again, but this is a new kind of circuits that requires special clocking to do that. And also we need to keep in mind that CMOS itself is a moving target. It's going to become better and better. One, uh, one uh, example is, as I mentioned, looking at nanowires and either in the lateral case or the vertical case. And we've been collaborating with IMEC about benchmarking these and, and evaluating their potential performance. And, and this is at the uh, level of a processor, an ARM processor. And the conclusion was that the lateral device was better for high performance because you can still apply strain and get higher mobility whereas the vertical device was better for low power applications. Now, we saw that beating CMOS in Boolean applications is very difficult. And that takes us to places where we try to take advantage of the physics of the device and make circuits that are more efficient. So to do this kind of benchmarking for non-traditional circuits, we had to uh, have some requirements. The circuit should have many applications. It shouldn't be a very niche uh, kind of circuit. It should be something that can be used to implement many beyond CMOS devices efficiently so that you can have a meaningful benchmarking. And it should have well-defined boundaries and specs. So for that purpose, cellular neural networks uh, were a good candidate because they can do many tasks. It's a universal uh, computer, so it can do any, it's a complete uh, uh, function. It can do anything that you want with it. And it's very efficient in doing image processing and associated memory and tracking targets and et cetera. And at the heart of it is dot product, which is used in many other circuits. So the way that cellular neural networks work is that it's a 2D array of cells where cells are connected to each other only 
uh, locally. And the dynamic of each cell is dictated by equation like this. So this is the state variable of cell ij. And it's, there is a feedback factor. And there is a linear combination of all the inputs to the uh, circuit. And the linear combination of the states nearby and some biasing condition. So the, the normal way of implementing this is by making, by using op amps for the neurons and all the synapses which determine what is the weight is dictated by these uh, OTAs, operational transconductance uh, amplifiers. So basically you can use MOSFET or you can use TFETs to implement these amplifiers on OTAs. Uh, Steep subthreshold devices would be good because they're going to give you better gain, lower power. But at the same time, uh, you could do ASIC design. You can do digital uh, circuit design, and for each cell, you have an ASIC circuit which does exactly the same. So the digital option is also there. And then we wanted to do spintronic implementation of this in a more uh, efficient way. And if you look at the LLG equation, which dictates the dynamic of a magnet, it's very similar to the dynamic of the CNN. So the same kind of uh, equation is applied. And if you think about it, if you look at this AS cell, cell, the current that you pass through this will generate spin current, which will switch this magnet. Now, this behaves like an integrator. And you see that as you increase this current, you're going to get faster switching. But the key is that this equation is very similar to, to this equation. And we can take advantage of that. So you can uh, put a reference resistance here. So this is an MTJ. The orientation of this magnet would determine the resistance of this uh, device. There is a reference point here. And then there is a uh, normal CMOS inverter, which amplifies this signal and derives the nearby cells. And then this is the driving circuit. And the size of these transistors <coughs> determines what is the weight of each synapse. And this is the output voltage versus magnetiza magnetization direction. This is how uh, one cell, one complete cell would look like. And here is a simulation result taking account of thermal noise. And here we are showing one function, which is noise filtering. Um, here is an associative memory application. So it's, this circuit is supposed to correspond 1 to 2 and 3 to 4. And here you see how 1 is being transferred to 2. So these are uh, the simulations of all the magnets within the circuit. Now, to do the benchmarking, the case study that we looked at is this very simple associative memory case, when these, num these digits must be corresponded or transferred to these digits. And we look at various ways of doing this. So this is the benchmarking result. This is the cellular neural network benchmarking. And one of the things that I want to highlight is this light blue data points. These are spintronic devices. So for example, this is something similar to uh, uh, spin uh, diffusion or all spin logic. Uh, this is spin hall device. And these devices now can perform better than CMOS. Whereas if you remember the Boolean functions, these devices were many orders of magnitude worse than CMOS. And the reason here is that we are taking advantage of the physics of the device to do the, uh, the, the actual circuit, which is that uh, uh, the, the the dynamic of the cellular neural networks. So the benchmarking result is completely different when you do it for this particular uh, cellular neural network application compared to the Boolean case uh, that we talked about before. Now, one other uh, explanation of why these um, uh, spintronic devices can do much better than this is that if you look at the circuit here, each of these synapses are going to be uh, an OTA with many transistors. And this is an analog circuit. It's going to dissipate power all the time. 
Uh, there is this op amp, which is a much more complicated circuit, and it's going to be dissipating power. Whereas here, each synapse is just two transistors and a magnet, and the neuron is just these two MTJs and just two uh, inverters. So, um, one other good thing about cellular neural network is that people have shown that you can use cellular neural networks to efficiently implement convolutional neural networks. And convolutional neural networks are much more used these days for many applications that uh, requires uh, uh, machine learning and, uh, and, and inference from a big, large set of data. So this is the work that our collaborators, uh, Mike Niemeyer and Sharon Ho at Notre Dame have done. And they show that all the layers in a convolutional neural network, uh, they can be done in, uh, with, with cellular neural networks. And that, that, so these are, for example, examples of uh, those circuits that can be done with cellular neural networks. So the results that we have over there are uh, can be translated here, and we're working with them to try to benchmark the results for, for convolutional neural networks based on this. So uh, throughout the benchmarking, one thing that we've observed is that as your models become more and more accurate and you account for more limiting factors, then the benchmarking results become more pessimistic. But at the same time, if you rethink about what are the issues, what are the problems with these devices, and try to modify and reinvent these devices, the data points gradually move to the right corner. But still, it's going to be quite challenging to beat CMOS uh, in, uh, in the uh, Boolean domain. And novel system and circuit concepts are quite necessary to utilize the, the new properties of these devices. And one example is the cellular neural networks that have been implemented uh, with these beyond CMOS devices. So um, before I end, I want to acknowledge the people who have done the work. Um, Chen Yun Pan is a research engineer in my group. He's done a lot of work here. The current and former PhD students, uh, some of the names are listed here. They've done a lot of uh, work and uh, the results that you saw are mostly from them. We have some collaborators at Intel, which we have been working very closely. The, the benchmarking effort is guided by key, you know, representatives from the four major uh, uh, sponsor companies and all the uh, PIs and students within these StarNet uh, sets. So thank you very much for your time, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. say from uh, materials to system so the, the, the question space is huge so, <laughs> but the, the answer space may not be <laughs> as <laughs> hi Paul well, well thanks Azad, for the terrific presentation I was wondering in these different mechanisms for switching now mm -hmm. where is the which of these would be um, those where there's a critical material flaw that if that were overcome, you would you 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 could then see use of that. Are there any of them which are particularly attractive that if only there was the material or the process in place or something like that? I would say for most of them we have major material challenges. So for example, all the TFET devices. Uh, the, the demonstrated subthreshold swings are much above what the theory predicts, and in most cases it's due to the traps. Uh, so those trap states are limiting the minimum current. You can't go belong, below that. Um, uh, the 2D materials, the, the, the fabrication and material properties are very uh, stringent. Some of the magnetic devices um, still the, uh, the materials are not as mature. Um, so I think most of them are, you know, they need a lot of improvement in the material part. Yes, so as a, thanks for the presentation. Uh, 
fascinating. So one of the things that is most fascinating for me is that you can take the input from a device that you might not be able to fabricate two devices yet, right, and predict how a processor in the end will perform based on this technology. I think this is absolutely fascinating. The question that I have is, can you go back to the last benchmark slide that you, that you showed? Um, so, where you had that, where you had that trend for the Spintronic devices mm -hmm. and how you improve a particular technology. So what I'm trying to understand then, the initial technology is where you have experimental results already that you can use to verify your models. And then you change the geometry and these devices down the road, they have not even been fabricated yet or they have been? Um. In many cases, nothing has been fabricated completely. P you know, for, for example, if you look at this CSL device, uh, pieces have been demonstrated, the physics is well understood, but to integrate the entire device, we are still not there. So most of the changes that you see over this trend is redesigning the device itself. It's not that we started from this experimental point and we said what if we can make this part better, what if we can make this material better. Uh, it's basically starting from this original proposal and looking at okay when you put it in the circuit what is really limiting you? Uh, for example for this case was that the size of the magnets had to be big because of the two contacts that you had to make and now is there a way to break this device into smaller pieces and reuse the current that is coming and therefore not uh, uh, needing as much current so that uh, takes you maybe here or for, for example here you, uh, you, you add another layer to funnel electrons into the magnet. So, so you collect more spins and funnel them into the device. So these are not um, uh, th th these are the result of redesign of the device after learning what is limiting them. And I assume as you do that, the error bars increase, right? Yeah. So as you project further and further out, the circles should become bigger or...? Uh, well, actually, not, in mo not, not always. So sometimes because you are coming up with a better design and you actually make it uh, better and the error bar should get smaller. So it depends. If you become too spec, so if the trend here is just to become too speculative and say that what if I have a, a spin relaxation that can be 10 micron, then yes, that's, that's true. But when you are making this device better by coming up with a better design, and in many cases actually you make the device simpler, then no, the error bar is not going to increase. So, on, on these benchmarking plots, if you had to put a third axis, a third parameter mm -hmm, that you, mm -hmm. were, you were going to measure or, or to use as a benchmark, what would that third axis be? And then would that really change kind of the ordering? Right, right. I think that's a very good point. I think for some of these devices would be error rate because some of these devices have larger error rates. So that would be one factor. Um, another factor can be complexity of the device. Um, how difficult would be. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Let's thank us one more time. Thank you.